Hi, welcome to LPC Online. I'm Pastor Doug and I wanna thank you for joining us today, especially those who are watching for the first time. If you'd like to connect with us, you can go to our website, listdualpc.com and leave us a message. We really hope that God uses this time to help you grow in your faith and be encouraged. What's going on, LPC? How is everybody doing? Oh, come on, how is everybody doing? Good, I hope you said good. But if not, that's okay too. We are here, we are a family, and uh, we are worshiping together as one body in Christ, amen? So as we sing these songs this morning, wherever you are on your walk, um, whatever type of week that you have had, uh, please let it all go, lay it down at the altar, and let's worship the one and true living God, the one that is here and present and alive, even in the midst of such chaos. He is good. Amen? Amen? Awesome. Let's sing together. Oh, 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 oh. 
know, in these times of, of worship, of musical worship, um, I do encourage people to try and, and be open with God and, and, and have this conversation with him um, and to, to go over and reflect who we are in Jesus and, and what we're called to do. But it's also a time to remind each other as the church to say, God is with us. In that situation that you're dealing with at home, God is with you. In this pandemic, God is with us. In political unrest, God is with us. And so as we sing, I pray that you be reminded that our God is alive and that he is with us as we worship, as we sing. And it's only a small part of what he is blessed us with, he's going to bless us with. This amazing life that's a roller coaster is still beautiful because we worship him, because we are created in his image. And so as we sing, let's remind each other.
The title of his next song is pretty self-explanatory. It speaks for itself. There is a king. And so, oftentimes when we worship, you'll hear a worship leader say, lift your hands or raise your voice or, and sure, those are guidelines and those are to direct the congregation in singing. But if you're in a place where you need to feel vulnerable in just listening to lyrics and reflecting upon who God is in your life, don't feel like you are worshiping less because you're not singing or raising your hands. God meets you where you are. Worship isn't a, an action that we create. It's not something that we draw from a textbook or societal norms. Worship is a choice to say, God, here's my heart. Pour yours into it. Show me what it is that you want me to do, not only in my life, but unto others. Help me become more like Jesus. So wherever you are, if you know these words, please feel free to sing along. But if you don't feel like singing and you just want to hear from God, that's okay too. There is a king. He is alive and he's in us. Let's worship with this last song. There is a king seated among us. Let every heart receive him now. Where there is praise, he will inhabit, and there will be grace and mercy. Every burden will be lifted in His presence. Every trophy will be laid down at His feet. There is a name that reigns above all others. Jesus Christ, the King above. To the Lamb, honor and glory. Worthy is He who overcame. Buried in shame, risen in power. He is alive, and the stone is rolled. The 
here won't be long. We will behold him and every tear he'll wipe away. We'll be at home. The war won't be over. Soon we will meet our Savior face to face. Every burden will be lifted in His presence. Every truth So one of the main reasons that people often say they don't believe there is a God or the Christian God that is loving and kind couldn't possibly exist is because bad things just keep happening and often to very good people. And that's one of the main things they say is a real barrier and a stop for them to actually having faith and trusting in God. But I believe that it doesn't need to be exclusive. It doesn't need to be an either or situation. I believe that there can be a God who is loving and kind and bad things can still happen. Bad things still do happen. Now, the reason why I believe that's true is because you hear of accounts of it happening over and over again. And I mean, just look at Joseph's life. Joseph's life reveals a God who is loving and kind and all powerful, but yet bad things still happen. And even to Joseph when he was trying to live a good life. So, this is already proof within the Bible itself that God is kind and loving and bad things can still happen. But let's look a little bit more about how this actually came to pass. I mean, just last week for those people that were watching, we were talking about how God will often send detours in our life and put detours in our path. And he will often work with those detours and do great things. But most often when we face those, we pray and ask God, God, Take us away from the circumstance. Get us out of this situation. We don't want to be here anymore. And God is saying, no, you know what? I will bring the detour and not the deliverance because this detour is for a greater purpose. It is for something that will accomplish good in the end, but in the moment, it will seem like it's something bad. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about how this passage is going to be that second portion. It's almost like a part two, if you will, of last week's message where God brings detours and not deliverance. Today we're going to be looking at God, how God brings rerouting. God can reroute within the midst of a detour to bring something good from a situation that seems hopeless. And so we're going to be looking at chapter 37 and how it ended on a very strong note. And it actually becomes repeating again in chapter 39. It ends with Joseph going to Egypt. 
being sold as a slave and eventually being sold into the household of Potiphar. And so what's interesting is from 37, 38 is a very unique passage that actually follows the storyline of Judah and Tamar. And we're not going to be looking at that today because it's, it's a whole different plot line. I want to focus on Joseph and his story because I think that he has so much in his life that we can look at, especially this concept, concept of detours. But 39 is where they pick his story back up in Genesis chapter 39 and with some very familiar words. Just look at verse 1. This is where we get that scene and they set the scene in Joseph's life. It's saying, when Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was the captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. This is the exact same statement that they end 37 with. So I think it's almost like the author in the narration is trying to say, okay, bring your attention back to this plot line again. Here's where we ended. This is the note where the story ended. Let's pick it right back up again, right from where we ended. And so this is where I think everyone wants to be caught up to see from what seems to be a desperate situation, how God can take it to be something good. And so we're going to be looking at verses 2 to 6 now in Genesis 39. Now, the Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in all he did. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything that he owned. From the day that Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar and bless his household for Joseph's sake. All of his household affairs ran smoothly and his crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administration and complete administrative responsibilities over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. So there is a, a lot for us in that passage and there's a couple things that I wanted to focus on. But before we get into that, I just wanted for us to be able to say a prayer and say, God, help us to understand what we can draw from this passage, what you're trying to say through it, and what we can draw for our lives. If you would join with me, let's say a word of prayer now. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the fact that you bring us your word and the story of Joseph, that we can learn from it. Help us today realize what you were accomplishing in Joseph's life. And more than that, what it should mean to us today, what we can draw from this passage. Help us to understand that you are good even when it doesn't seem that way. And you are working even when we can't see you working. Help us to be able to understand and appreciate that you are never abandoning or leaving us and you are working things out for our good. We ask and pray, God, that this truth would be brought to light for us and that we would understand what it means for our circumstances, what it means for all the situations we find ourselves in today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is going on in this passage? Well, we do know that Joseph's life had taken a huge detour. And that's something that we've been able to understand. He went from being the favorite son of Jacob. He was treated better than all of his brothers. And he was being groomed by Jacob to kind of take over the family business. The legacy was being passed on to him. Now, he had an easy life, a comfortable life. But then his brothers, his brothers who hated him and were jealous of the fact that his father loved him more, decided to take those things away from him. They decided to mess up his life and seriously change his fate. Now, initially they wanted to kill him, but God spared his life. But that didn't change his situation from being horrible and life-threatening to suddenly good. In fact, his life almost took a turn for the worst and he was sold into slavery to a bunch of Ishmaelite traders who were passing by. So his brothers literally sold his life away. Joseph went from having everything to having nothing. This is this massive detour that happened. His life almost did a U-turn. He went from having everything going so well, so smoothly, having great dreams, ideas of what he could accomplish, to having all of it taken away. 
and taken away in the matter of a moment where he suddenly lost his rights and freedoms. He was treated as a less than human servant that was invisible, not even cared for and recognized. But through all of this, God continued to move. And I love these moments. These moments always remind me of that, those two words where a situation presents itself, but then we get to say, but God. But God had other plans. But God could take this broken and this helpless, hopeless situation that didn't seem to be changing and start to reroute his circumstances, start to change everything. God can take something or someone that is broken and redeem them. Even when it seems impossible or highly unlikely, God can and does often bring this reroute. And so what's interesting is he really does bring this change, this shift in Joseph's life. Just look at verse 2. Joseph shows up to a brand new place, having a brand new master, trying to learn how things are supposed to be. He would be at the very bottom of the pole when it comes to seniority, especially within a household where there would be a culture of the well-known and the favorite servants and slaves and the brand new guy that would get the worst jobs and the one who didn't know any better. But the Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served the house of his Egyptian master. Even in a helpless situation, even in slavery, even in a place where he was given no rights, no freedoms, and would have been invisible and given the worst of the jobs, the messiest, the thankless of the jobs, God has his favor and his hand on Joseph and begins to work in his life. The Lord was with Joseph. Joseph. He may not have saved him, even though I'm sure Joseph probably cried out and asked and prayed God over and over to remove him from this circumstance, to somehow get him back to his father and his family and his life that he used to have. But God doesn't save him, but he hadn't given up on Joseph either. He had not abandoned him. No, he was working with Joseph. He was working through Joseph and working in Joseph's detour. God was saying, let me take this broken situation and make something good out of it. Make something incredible out of it. I mean, I can just hear God when he said, listen, Joseph, you may not be on the path or the route that I laid out for you. You may not be in the place that I wanted you to be, but I can work with this. I can still get you where you're supposed to be. I can still get you where you need to be. It will just take some rerouting. And oftentimes that's where we get caught up. If you're anything like me, this is where you become so frustrated. You type in where you wanna go on your GPS. You say, listen, I'm in Google Maps and I wanna go from this point, point A to point B, and I wanna get there the fastest. I wanna avoid any construction. I wanna avoid any traffic. I wanna find the fastest way to get from point A to point B. And as you're driving along, suddenly something changes. Maybe you lose signal. Maybe the satellite drops you for some reason. Or maybe you take a wrong turn. And suddenly your GPS does the famous rerouting, rerouting, and it's working itself out, trying to find how to get you from where you are to where you want to be and where you're supposed to be. And I think that that is what we're able to see going on. That's what God is doing in Joseph's life. Well, God is rerouting in his life, and it worked. In fact, it worked so well that even Potiphar, who followed the Egyptian gods, who didn't even honor and respect the gods of Israel, saw that there was something different about Joseph, and he liked what he saw. Listen to verse 3. Potiphar noticed that God was working with it. He, He noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. And he was so impressed by God's work in his favor that Potiphar decided to take the newest servant and slave and give him greater authority. He wanted to take advantage of this great miracle, this blessing that Joseph had. And so he decided to make Joseph his personal assistant. Now, this is a promotion that was not given to the newest servant. Being a master's personal assistant was usually reserved for that slave that had proven themselves. They had proven that they know how to handle their job well. They had proven that they could be trusted and that they understood the culture, understood the family dynamics. They were well aversed and trained in the situation. Those were the ones that normally got to be raised to that level of authority. 
because they had gained that seniority, they had proven themselves. But Potiphar says, no, I'm going to choose the new guy and I'm going to make him to be the one now that's going to have authority as my personal assistant to speak to all of these other servants and slaves in the household. I want to give him that authority because he was so impressed by God's favor and how God was blessing Joseph and changing his circumstance. And Potiphar's like, you know, in fact, I think I'm wanting him to be right beside me so some of that blessing can come on to me, so I can take advantage of this circumstance. I can gain success off of what God is doing to bless Joseph. He was being a very wise and shrewd man, but he did something that was very, very different, very unique. He said, I'm going to take the new guy and I'm going to give him that position of authority. I'm going to raise him up to make him my personal assistant. And verse 5 says, because of this choice, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All of his household's affairs, they ran smoothly and his crops and his livestock flourished. This is where we get to see God showing up. And God is blessing Joseph. And anything that Joseph touched, even when Joseph was in a horrible situation, a horrible circumstance where he lost everything and was encountering this massive detour, this detour where his life took a huge U-turn and he felt like I'm now in a place where I cannot ever escape. It's hopeless and I feel like I am in a place where I can never get out of. But God said, let me work this out for you. If you allow me to change your circumstances, to work in them right now, I can take this detour and make it into something that is good. And because of this, because of his success, Potiphar doesn't stop there. In fact, verse 6 says, He gave Joseph complete administrative authority and responsibility over everything he owned. The only person that had more authority in Potiphar's house was him, Potiphar. Everything else he said, Joseph is now the one who represents and speaks for me. This servant, this slave who was nobody, now suddenly was in charge of the entire household. All of his businesses, all of his interactions that he would be doing with other Egyptian businessmen that was going through Joseph. Suddenly the fact that when he would be entertaining guests and working with all of these different people, trying to impress them, Joseph was now the one who was handling all of those affairs. He became the face, the figurehead, the representation of Potiphar's house and was in charge of every single detail of planning and working out everything within his household and his entire portfolio. This was a person who was sold as a slave with no rights, no freedoms, and would be treated like nothing, to suddenly being elevated to a position of absolute authority and power and respect within Potiphar's house, who was an officer in the court of Pharaoh and was the captain of the Pharaoh's guard. So Potiphar had a high house in the Egyptian court, and Joseph was elevated within that to be a position of authority and power. A slave to this. That is a miraculous transformation. A redemptive work that God was doing to take someone who was in a hopeless detour and situation and say, I can redeem that. I can make it better. If you trust me and let me do that rerouting, I will get you to a place that seems desperate where you're completely lost and get you to where you need to be. You may not be on the right path or road that I intended for you, but I can get you back to where you're supposed to be if you just let me work. And God did. So much so that Potiphar stopped worrying about anything. He went on vacation. It was like a vacation mode or an early retirement. He didn't worry about anything because he was that trusting in Joseph and believed he had everything taken care of. So much so that it says the only choice that he made was what to eat that day. That was the only decision he had to make. The rest of it was he said, Joseph, you take care of it. You are in charge of everything. My entire calendar, my business, my finances, everything within my house is under your care. And because of that, I now have absolute peace. 
That is how much Potiphar trusted Joseph and gave him that much authority. That is incredible. That just does not happen. But yet with God, it did. Even when his situation seemed like it was horrible and things were never going to get better, God said, no, trust me. I can take this hopeless situation, this detour that seems to be so, so incredible, so massive. I will be able to get you for a place where you feel like you're lost to where you need to be again. Just let me guide you. Let me work behind the scenes to bring something new, to change your circumstances. And now I believe that this is where we can learn from the story of Joseph because I don't know about you, but I have encountered detours in my life. Thankfully, I have never been sold into slavery. That is not something I've had to deal with, but I have encountered other detours. In times where I thought I was heading the right path, I thought everything was lined up for me, but then God would bring a curveball or life circumstances would change. And it suddenly feel like I'm in a place now where I didn't know where I was supposed to go, what I was supposed to do and how I could get back on track. I didn't even know if my dreams were a possibility anymore. But I've realized that God can redeem any, cir- uh, any circumstance, any situation. He can save us and he can bring us back to where we need to be. He can reroute our life to get us beyond the place where we are that seems to be an inescapable place, back to where we need to be, so we can be walking in his will, on his path. Now, this is what I believe it means for us to trust God when he is doing this rerouting in our life. But the best part too is no matter what circumstance you find yourself in today, no matter what you find yourself enduring and experiencing, no matter how hard it may be or hopeless, no matter how many times you have prayed and said, God, save me from this situation. If we allow God to change our circumstances and reroute our path, it can become a reality. He can redeem a broken situation and make it beautiful again. He can take people with no hope and bring us back to a place where we're walking in life as he intended it. But we have to choose to do a couple different things. One is we have to listen when God calls. We have to choose to say, okay, God, if you are willing to do this, I have to listen to you and your guidance. I have to recognize your voice and I have to trust in you when you bring that guidance, when you say, listen, in order to get back in the path, I need you to do this. I need you to turn left now. I need you to decide to do a different path than what you're on right now. We have to listen and trust that God truly has a better GPS than we do. His satellite gives him the perspective to see our life from beginning to end. So we have to trust that he knows better how to get ourselves to where we need to be. He knows better where the final destination is. We may have that wrong. We may think we're going to a different path and God's saying, no, your destination is what needs to change. Or it may be how we get ourselves there. But we have to trust that God knows better than we do on how we need to get there and where we need to go. And we need to choose then to trust him and obey. But the beautiful thing is for us, we can have faith to believe that we have a God that will never abandon us. He will never leave us, no matter what our situations feel like. He will never abandon us and leave us alone. He will always be working in our life to accomplish what is best and what is right for us. And God loves us so much. He has great dreams for us. He has a higher purpose for each and every one of us to accomplish some incredible things. We have to put our trust in Him. And say, God, if you know best where I need to go and how to get there, then I'm giving you full authority in my life to accomplish your will and your purpose. Take me wherever I need to go. Because I'm realizing now that if I trust in you, I can get to where I need to be. Even if it takes detour after detour, I'm putting my trust in you. I hope that's something that you can understand and that you can be able to really, I believe, apply to your life. That you can say, God, I wanna live this way. I wanna trust you. I wanna say a prayer for us, that we would have the, the wisdom to be able to understand when God is giving us that guidance. 
the ability to hear him, but more than anything, the faith and the courage to put our life in his hands. If you would just pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for the fact that you are good, that you are always in control of our lives, even when we don't recognize that you're at work, even when we don't see your hand moving. Help us to have that faith, to know that you have promised this. Help us to trust your promises are true and they're yes and amen. So God, in everything that we're doing, give us the faith to obey you and to walk the path that you're giving us wherever that leads. Even when we're in the middle of a hopeless and helpless situation, give us the ability to say, God, I'm trusting that you are going to be able to get me to where I need to be. And if I need to be in this place, help me to be faithful to that. But if it's in your will, God, give me the capacity to trust that you are rerouting my path so I can get from what seems hopeless and dark and bad to a place that is good and right and appointed by you. I pray, God, that this would be a time for people to have faith and trust in you and obey and for there to be real change, transformation, redemption to be happening so people can rise above their circumstances and have some incredible things happen in their life, some miracles of you working, even when it didn't seem possible, you showing up. And I ask and pray for all the people that are watching now and even in the future, may this be an encouragement to them to put their faith in you, to put their life in your hands and say, God, I trust you are taking me where I need to go and the right path to get there. I ask and pray, God, that that would be reality for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my, uh, my benediction for you is taken from Psalm 32, verse 8, and it's, it's one that I really enjoy. It says, May we never forget your promise to guide us along the best the best pathways for our life, to guide us along the best pathways for our life and promise to advise and watch over us. God, help us to believe this, to hold on to that truth and to keep trusting you with our lives today. That is my prayer for each and every one of the people, that we would understand that. Thank you so much for watching and I pray that God uses this to bring you encouragement and strength. May you have an incredible day. Take care.